Hello, I'm Mr. Johnston, and this is AP Biology. Welcome to section 1.13. We're going to cover nucleic acids here. Uh, as a quick recap, I just want to make sure you guys remember that we've been talking about the macromolecules, which are the large organic molecules that ultimately make up our cells. And we've said that there's four basic groups that we'll discuss. And so we talked about during 1.10, we talked about carbs. During 1.11, we talked about the lipids. Uh, we just finished up 1.12 where we talked about proteins and so now we're on the last group which is ultimately going to be nucleic acids. Now I want to make sure because some of you guys seem confused that each of these guys is distinct from the other. So in general with the stuff we're talking about now at least you're going to be a protein or a lipid or a carb or nucleic acid. So we're not going to kind of bleed these guys together. The only way you can lump them together is if you're just talking about organic compounds as a whole, you know, any organic compound. Beyond that, we're going to split them, up, split them apart, so you need to pay attention to what each one does, how it's used. So if I ask you questions when we get to the test over all of this, you can go through and say, oh yeah, you know, if that one's in plant cell walls, that's going to be a type of carbohydrate, namely cellulose. Uh, if it's going to help with chemical reactions, that's going to be an enzyme, it's going to be a protein. And if we talk about information being stored in our body, that's going to ultimately be nucleic acids, that's going to be DNA. So just keep that in the back of your mind so you can separate these into four groups as we intend uh, as we move forward. So starting off, the nucleotide is going to be the monomer of a nucleic acid. So a nucleic acid is going to have a bunch of these nucleotides stuck together. And when we stick all these nucleotides together, the polymer of a nucleic acid is going to be a polynucleotide. You'll also oftentimes see that they'll just call it a nucleic acid. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but just like we had those terms that were pretty much similar, and that at least for now, we'll use pretty interchangeably the, the polypeptide and the protein, uh, you'll see with these ones, a polynucleotide is really just another word for a nucleic acid. And in this case, it actually is pretty much equal. We don't have to add the, the special star like we did with proteins where a protein is not exactly the same thing as a polypeptide, so we kind of discuss that. In this case, you can say nucleic acid, you can say polynucleotide. I don't mind. I'm bringing up both terms because I might use either term, and I don't want you guys to get confused during a test, a quiz, in class, if I happen to mention one term instead of the other. They basically are the same thing, so we can always add that to the end here. Uh, nucleic acid's fine. And then the two common types that we'll go into more in depth as we get through the podcast will be DNA and RNA. So deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. And then the elements that we're going to find, we've been trying to go through and kind of discuss the elements that you commonly find in each of these macromolecules. Uh, and so I want to make sure you realize this is going to have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's what all of them have. But if you remember that carbs and lipids typically only have these guys. Uh, we talked about nitrogen is also found in proteins, but proteins tended to have sulfur. We won't have sulfur in nucleic acids. Instead, we're going to have phosphorus. So that P here stands for phosphorus, and that's going to be the guy that kind of is our uh, indicator, if you will, where if I talk to you about the chemical structure of something, phosphorus is usually a pretty good giveaway that it's likely a nucleic acid because the other macromolecules don't tend to have phosphorus. I won't say never, but not normally. Uh, so with nucleotides, kind of discussing what they are, uh, nucleotides are going to be made of three parts. They're going to have what's called a base or a nitrogen base is commonly what it will be referred to as. And so that's the part that will actually change because there will be several different types of bases. So if you're looking at the nitrogen base in DNA, you'll see that they have adenine, that's A, thymine, that's T, cytosine, that's C, and guanine, that's G. So I'm going to kind of just use the letters for abbreviations because that's what we'll commonly do, but you should be capable if I say something like adenine, you should be capable of understanding whoops, uh, what I'm talking about. So just erase that. Uh, if I say cytosine, once again, it's the same basic idea, guanine. Don't freak out when you see me use the letters. That's pretty much what I'm going to do for most things. Now with RNA, it's a slightly different molecule. So one of the differences will be it has a different nitrogen base. So instead of thymine here, we're going to have uracil. 
So if you see something that contains uracil, you know it's RNA. If you see something that contains thymine, you'll know it's DNA. All the other nitrogen bases will be identical though. They both have adenine, they both have cytosine, they both have guanine. So that part won't change regardless of whether it's DNA or RNA. The other parts of a nucleotide is each nucleotide beyond the nitrogen base will have a phosphate group. Uh, that's just a P with some O's around it. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into the chemistry of it, but that's just called a phosphate. And it's going to have a pentose sugar. And so you'll see it's, it's called that. It's, it's a sugar, and it's called pentose because it typically has five carbons that make it up. And so kind of each of the points here, well, technically one and then the four points here, are going to be made up, and they're carbons. So five carbon, pentose, there we go. So there will be the sugar, phosphate, nitrogen base. Every nucleotide that there is will have a sugar, a phosphate, and a nitrogen base. Now, there will be four different types of nucleotides uh, when it comes to DNA because obviously some of them have A, some have T, some have C, some have G. There will also be four types of nucleotides with RNA, A, U, C, and G. But these four different types of nucleotides, when strung together in really, 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 really long chains, will make up every molecule of DNA. And if we're using the four nucleotides for RNA, those four will make up every strand of RNA that there is. So this is all it is to get ultimately the DNA in our bodies and the RNA in our bodies is these, nu these four different nucleotides for each strung together in really long chains. Now, discussing DNA a bit more, just because it's our common example when we talk about this a lot. So DNA is going to be a double helix, and what that means is it's two strands, essentially, uh, two rows of nucleotides uh, that are going to be stuck together. And it's a helix because when they stick together, they twist. So they oftentimes call it like a twisted ladder, where if you took a ladder, you've got where each side of the ladder would be one strand of DNA, and the rungs, right in the middle of the rungs, they would be like glued together, if you will. They'd be stuck together. And then if you took that ladder and you were able to twist it so it becomes like a spiraling ladder, that would be a double helix. It looks just like that, if you will, when it comes down to it. Now the backbone, the sides of the DNA, if you will, you'll see here are the phosphate, the sugar, the phosphate, the sugar, the phosphate, the sugar. So you can see that we've got like a nucleotide here. We've got a nucleotide here. So we've got these nucleotides that go all the way up. So this particular sample we're looking at contains four nucleotides. And you can see off the left, because I'm looking at the left strand, we're going to have phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. And then in the middle, you'll see that we've got this bond that's holding the nitrogen base, and the nitrogen base kind of sticks out to the middle. And so the nitrogen base here is going to be part of the rung. So in this case, it's the left-hand side of the rung. Now on the right-hand side of the rung, we're going to have another nitrogen base, but this will be the nitrogen base from the other strand. And you'll see the other strand also has a phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. So you can go through and you can do the same thing where you cover it all up uh, and you look and see that it's four nucleotides, same basic thing. Uh, but you'll notice here that we're going to have these dotted lines in the middle. So where the nitrogen bases meet, there's these, these dotted lines that connect them. And it's, it's those dotted lines that represent the hydrogen bonds. And so those are hydrogen bonds that we're looking at. All right. And the key thing about those is that the bases have a partner. We call it the complement. So it's complementary bases. And what this means is that if you have a C, a cytosine, it wants to partner up with a guanine. And by want, what I mean is it's most stable for it to line up with it because they'll stick together. So it's kind of like if you've got magnets and they kind of want to stick together if you line them up properly. So in our case, C and G will line up properly, and so they'll want to stick together, so they'll form these hydrogen bonds. If I have an A and a T, an adenine and a thymine, they will also want to line up together and form these hydrogen bonds, which will then hold them together. It will ultimately allow us to take these two strands and connect them. So the backbone, all the actual stuff that connects the nucleotide itself, so all the bonds in phosphate, all the bonds in the sugar, all the bonds in the nitrogen base, and all the bonds that hold those three things together. Those are all covalent. We call that the covalent backbone. But the bonds that actually connect the two separate DNA strands, those are hydrogen bonds. And this is important because if DNA is going to break, it's always going to break down the middle. 
So the ladder essentially is always going to break at the middle of the rungs, and so eventually you get half of a ladder on either side if you were to kind of rip them apart. And this will be important because it helps us make copies of DNA when we need to, because you can always have each C find a new partner, a new G. Each A can go find a new partner, another T, and so we can actually rebuild the strands just like they were. So this will be an important thing for making DNA be stable. It's an important thing for allowing us to make copies of DNA. So this complementary base idea is going to be an important one, that adenine only wants to be with thymine. You can see here thymine's with adenine again, cytosine, guanine, guanine, cytosine. So they're only going to want to pair up that specific way, and it helps keep DNA stable. Because if DNA screws up, it's very bad for you in most cases. All right, so we've kind of got the basic structure of DNA, and now we've got kind of a, a, we'll just do a comparison to keep things simple. So DNA versus RNA. So DNA we've seen has two strands. RNA is going to be just one of those strands. It doesn't have that partner. So it'll still look the same if you look at the DNA pictures. So if we kind of go back, it's just going to look like if I kind of get rid of this whole other side, that's essentially what you're going to see if you look at RNA. The only difference, of course, is whenever you see a T, it would become a U for uracil. But otherwise, it'll look very, very similar. Uh, if you go and you look as well, you'll see that there will be uracil instead of thymine. So I just kind of drew that on. So that's a giveaway. And the other thing that you won't notice very much is it has a different sugar. The sugar on the surface will look pretty much exactly the same. All you'll notice, if you really pay, paid close attention, is at the bottom of the sugar, that is a horrible pentose, uh, is one of them will have two OHs. And you don't have to know this, but I'm just doing it so if you want to, you can get a feel for why it is. Uh, whereas when you look at DNA, and I'm doing this from memory, so I might do it wrong, uh, it's basically going to be missing one of those oxygens. That's it. That's the whole deoxyribose. It's a ribose sugar that's missing an oxygen. So it is a different sugar. And if we are testing it molecularly, we can actually detect that it's a different sugar. So that means that a nucleotide of DNA, even if it has the same nitrogen base, so if you have an adenine nucleotide, it would not be the same as an adenine nucleotide of RNA because they're going to have a different sugar that's part of the nucleotide. Every RNA nucleotide has this ribose guy. Every DNA nucleotide has deoxyribose. So something as simple as a missing oxygen separates these two things relatively dramatically. There's only three big differences, and that's one of them. All right, so different sugar, one different nitrogen base, and different strands, one stranded versus two stranded. So that'll be our, our overall structural differences. And then they'll have a differences in how we use them. So when we talk about the function of our nucleic acids, two living organisms, they are going to be f functioning in this idea of protein synthesis is what we normally call it. All right, so synthesis just means to make. So this is where our body makes proteins. And we've already discussed the fact that proteins are a really big deal that pretty much determines everything about you. So which proteins you make has a huge impact in what you look like, your ability to survive, your ability to reproduce. And DNA is the one that has the blueprints or the code for the proteins. So it's not always going to be that if you have a specific gene, which is the code for a protein, it doesn't always mean you have to use it. But ultimately, if I change a gene, if I modify a gene, if you try to use that gene now, you are going to make a protein that is not what it was originally going to be. And if it's changed at all, there's a good chance that it won't function as well or perhaps at all at its original role. And so this can, in some cases, if it damages something important, lead to death. And so you don't want to mess with, especially your important genes, you don't want to mess with them because they're the code. You know, if you screw up the blueprint for a house and you leave out something that supports a chunk of the house, the house is going to come falling down. It's not going to function properly. But DNA doesn't actually make the proteins. It just has the code. We need RNA to ultimately make them. So what's going to happen is DNA is going to stay typically in your nucleus. Uh, it's going to kind of stay protected in most cells, at least eukaryotic cells that have a nucleus. And what we're going to do is we're going to make RNA from the DNA. So we're going to kind of make like an RNA copy. And so by making a copy, we preserve the original, the DNA, and make sure it's not changed or messed up. The RNA can then go and actually build or assemble the protein. So the RNA will do the work of making that protein. So RNA will allow us to get to this last step of the protein. 
and we call this DNA to RNA to protein the central dogma because this is kind of the, the main idea behind biology that explains how it is that the DNA, the genes that we possess, ultimately lead to the proteins. And these proteins, as we said, ultimately lead to how we're, our success or, or how successful we are as an individual, as a species, how good we do at surviving, and how good we do at being able to procreate as much as possible and pass on those genes to the next group. So that's the overall purpose of nucle nucleic acids. Hopefully you guys understand just how important they are, why they're important, and why you ultimately do not want to irradiate yourself because most likely, even though you will change your DNA, you are not going to become an X-Man. At best, you're probably going to become Cancer Man, and I don't think anybody wants to be that. Uh, so stay away from things that cause damage to your DNA. Make sure you understand what DNA, RNA does and make sure you understand the structure of DNA, RNA, and nucleic acids as a whole, and you should be good. I'll see you guys later as we pick up with some chemical reactions in the next podcast. Take it easy.